Now we come to interval periapical techniques. Basic uh, interval periapical technique, long cone parallel technique, boys, and short cone bisecting angle technique. The long cone, like I told you, the film is held in a film uh, holder, and the film is positioned parallel to the long axis of the tube of the tooth, and the central ray is directed exactly at 90 degrees. Okay, so this is known as long cone or parallel technique. In bisecting angle technique, what happens is the film is held by the patient or a finger. You can also use a holder, but that is very uncomfortable. And there's a you you the long axis of the tooth and the long axis of film. There's a bisector, and the central ray is directed perpendicular to this bisector to get a proper image. Now, though a long cone technique follows all the uh, uh, rules of uh, projection geometry, we still use bisecting technique regularly everywhere. Can you think of why that is possible? Why do we do that? The thing is that the long cone you know, is very long, it's 16 inches. And that is a, a too large a space. We need a lot of space. And we over here have a lot of space constraint. And therefore, this is more comfortable to use. So let's compare intraoral periapical techniques, the long short cone and the long cone. Short cone diffusion and distortion of the image occurs. Long cone, you get sharp details. Short cone, increased chances of elongation and short. Long cone, image is obtained in the same size and shape as the object. Short cone, you have distorted image of teeth due to oblique exposure and bending of film. Long cone, image of the teeth nearly anatomically accurate. Short cone, shadow of the alveolar bone may, uh, may be seen. Alveolar crest is seen in the true relation to, to the teeth. In short cone, increased vertical angulation. Whereas in long cone, less vertical angulation. And because of this, the buccal and parts of the teeth are close to each other in on the radiograph, and more tooth area under the restoration can be seen. In short cone, superimposition of the shadow of the zygomatic arch is often occurs. So you are unable to see the periapical region, especially in the upper uh, first molar region. This does not occur in long cone technique. Short cone easier technique to maneuver, requires less space. Long cone needs a larger working space. Short cone more effective when the palate is shallow, especially children with adult sized teeth but underdeveloped jaws. Long cone in a similar situation, advices of the teeth will get cut off. In short cone, in rare cases when the teeth are longer than the film, the entire tooth may be seen by overangulating the vertical angulation. But this is not possible in the long cone technique. In short cone, cone cutting is a common error. This does not happen in long cone because the PID is also has a positioning. Uh, the, the film holder holds the film and it has a PID positioning or, uh, apparatus also. So the alignment becomes automatic. Short cone, poor film due to incorrect film, uh, finger pressure. Long cone, use of film holding device prevents such an error. Now, this is the intraoral periapical radiograph which you see. When do we take intraoral periapical? Over here, this is, these are all the ones on the periphery are intraoral periapical radiographs. The middle four radiographs are the bitring radiographs which we'll be talking about later. Indication of periapical radiographs is detection of apical infection, assessment of periodontal status, stroma to teeth, assessment of presence and position of unadaptive teeth, tooth morphology, endodontic treatment, pre-operative assessment and post-operative appraisal of apical surgery, detailed evaluation of apical cysts, and assessment and position and prognosis of implants. Now we come. Now, before I go further, I want to uh, uh, be very specific about this because, you know, in your MCQs, also, MCQ name, in your short uh, uh, SAQs, they ask you what are the contents of an XA packet. And there's another question which comes, describe the contents of an XA film. X-ray film is this small little green thing which is here. It has, it has a plastic base, gelatin, and emulsion. And when you talk about an X-ray packet, it is this packet which has a plastic cover, the lead, the shield, the black paper, and the plastic film. Please don't confuse between the two. Because if you are going to write, tell me about the X-ray film, when I'm asking about, for the packet, and if you're going to write about the X-ray packet, when I'm asking about the X-ray film, you'll get zero. So be careful, read your paper properly. If it's XA film, then you talk about the plastic base, the gelatin, and the silver crystals, the crystals which are there, the silver halide crystals. 
Then I ask you for the packet. You talk about the plastic cover, which protects it from uh, any contamination and moisture. The lead foil, which prevents backscatter radiation and gives strength and backing. The black paper, which prevents. Uh, I'm sorry. The black paper, which prevents any light leakage, and the that's it. And the film, which helps you to record the image. Now, the biting radiography. This is used. To detect interproximal caries, monitoring progression of infant caries, detect secondary caries, evaluate per periodontal conditions. And it is mostly used in the posterior region for the premolars and the molar area. You have a film which has a bite wing tag or you have a bite wing film holder. Patient bites on the tag and the central ray is directed at 10 degrees. Plus 10 degrees. Okay. Anterior bite wing lipses are also taken but not very, very routinely. Radiography or sandwich radiography. Now, this is taken to locate retained tools of extracted teeth, open emery teeth, foreign bodies, saliva stones, and many, especially for expansion of the lesion. Now, the occlusion films, occlusion radiography is divided, classified into maxillary occlusion and mandible occlusion. It is further called, classified into cross sectional and topographic views. Let's see. Now, see, all these are occlusion views. The upper ones, the upper ones are the maxillary, the lower ones are the mandibular. Now you can see that this is different from this. Okay, now this is a cross-sectional view with the point of entry is from the bridge of the nose. Whereas this is a topographic view, anterior topographic view with the point of entry is from the tip of the nose. This was the bridge of the nose, this is the tip of the nose. And this is on the lateral side, the lateral side. So this is topographic anterior, this is lateral left or right you have to mention as per the directions same way you see is this is occlusion of the mandibular occlusion views this is cross-sectional point of entry is three about three centimeters behind the chin this is the topographic mandible anterior where the point of entry as it is at the chin and this is the lateral topographic okay so now this is the difference between inner spotters if you tell me that this is a Maxillary occlusal view, I will give you half the marks. But if you tell me whether this is a cross-sectional or a topographic view, I know that you know more and you understand more. And so I will give you half a mark more. Intraoral localization technique. There is one very useful technique known as a tube shift or clap tool or slob rule. Slob is S-L-O-B. That is same side lingual, opposite side buckle. Very simple. Now this is a periapical radiograph which is taken. And this is an impacted molar. Now, in case uh, I want to know whether it is placed buckly or is it placed lingually. Now, what I will do is take another radiograph. Take another radiograph. Take another radiograph and shift the tube measly. Now, if the tooth also shifts measly, then same side measly. If the tooth shifts lingually, then it is in the opposite side direction. So now here you can see it has shifted. Radiograph is taken with a mesial shift and the molar appears to have shifted mesially. So it is on the same side. So this is lingually placed. So this is a helpful guide to the surgeon. Now it is important to know that we, we are talking about conventional imaging but the world is progressing and digital imaging is coming into it. So we also need to be aware about what is digital imaging. The advantage of digital imaging is we do away with the dark room processing, no chemical processing, no radiographic film. Instantly we'll be able to see the image, less radiation to the patient. Per cost of uh, exposure, if the cost is very, very less. The ability to manipulate, you know, because you see it on the computer, and in the computer you have lots of tools, so you can enlarge, you can, uh, you know, you can, if the contrast is not proper, the density is not proper, you can make it uh, lighter darker, etc. And you can play with the tools which are available. You can measure certain things. Okay. And these images can be easily transferred by email, via WhatsApp. So if you want a second opinion, then it can be easily taken. Disadvantage, the initial setup cost is very expensive. Not only do you have to buy the uh, equipment, you also have to buy a laptop you need. Okay. So the initial cost is more expensive. Image Quality is not as good as your conventional films. Uh, Sensors are bulky and difficult to put in the patient's mouth. You need a computer network, lack of hard copy. Panoramic and cephalometry units are very, very expensive. Acceptance by third-party carriers is variable. 
okay now if you want to this uh, the storage digital is easier distribution this is digital is easier queuing against our copy can be easily viewed and by a large number of audience live span the screen can be deteriorates over a period of time when this image remains as is cost analog is cheaper per film but in the long run the digital becomes cheaper these are the various uh, sensor this is the film this is the psp sensor this is the rbg sensor and this is the see do you know this has wires these are connected and already in the industry we have lot of tubings and wires all across our floor this is an additional wire and in case you are uh, working stool or something or you step on this wire that's the end of it you have to buy a new sensor so uh, because of that also this new sensors are there with a small little battery so that these wires are eliminated but this makes the sensor more large and bulky and it is more difficult for the patient to put in the mouth so every advantage has a disadvantage you need to find out what is most comfortable for you to work with this is just a picture this is a opg which is showing you a digital opg and a conventional opg now if my digital opg had also come something like this with the tools which are available i could have manipulated and seen but once a conventional radiograph is processed and developed i cannot make any changes only thing is i can use the intensifying the light intensifying light so that i can increase the light or decrease the light and maybe see a get a better visualization of radiation on biological tissues now like this i already told you it is because of the property of ionization that various sort uh, of uh, biological changes take place so radiation effects can be classified as deterministic and stochastic which can be either direct or indirect acute or chronic you can go up to the biological molecules where proteins and nucleic acid is affected cellular levels where intracellular and cell kinetics are affected and coming to acute and chronic i have already mentioned that you have somatic changes and genetic changes somatic changes are changes which are seen during the lifetime and it also can cause shortening of the life span whereas gen uh, genetic changes are the ones which will be seen in the offspring okay an injury during life span again can be acute and immediately seen or they can be low, uh, late chronic exposure and the changes will be gradually taking place the general effects of radiation on the oral cavity the oral mucous membrane is affected the taste buds are affected the salivary glands are affected and because the salivary glands are affected the consistency of the saliva and the content of the saliva changes and this is what brings about changes and uh, the tooth radiation carries otherwise an adult tooth is resistant to the direct effect of radiation an adult tooth will not get affected by radiation it is only because the saliva is affected and the tooth is surrounded by saliva all the time and then so hence you have this radiation caries which are of three types primary involving cementum and dentin generalized superficial lesions and dark pigmentations so let me tell you these effects of radiation that we are talking about now this is not during your dental day to day dental diagnostic radiographs so these effects radiation effects are more seen most commonly seen in people who are taking therapeutic radiation so we need to keep this in mind Okay. So, also, the radiation in a dental department. You have primary radiation that is directly from the X-ray tube. Okay. Then you have scattered radiation which comes from other parts of the X-ray tube, not from the PID. And then you have stray radiation. Sorry, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Primary radiation is what comes out from the PID. Scattered radiation is what comes out from the objects which are irradiated from the objects. and stray radiation or leakage radiation is what comes out from the extra tube other than the pid so now what do we need how do we protect ourselves we need protection for the operator protection for the patient and protection for the environment a protection for or uh, from radiation for the operator like i told you leakage radiation is through the tube head housing and scattered radiation is from object other than the patient so now how do we protect ourselves one is position distance rule we need to stand Six feet away from the source of radiation, stand behind a barrier. If there is no shield, use a lead apron. The film should never be held by the operator. Do not use fluorescent mirrors in the oral cavity while taking radiographs. Avoid holding the tube head. Neither tube housing nor cone should be held by the operator dentist. The machine should be periodically checked up. Use of high-speed films. Replace short 
the, pla the plastic phone, which is commonly available in the machines, should be replaced by an open-ended lead line phone. Adequate filtration, use of collimator, use of the TLD badge to monitor how much radiation you are exposed. These are happy little uh, lead uh, aprons, which the uh, operator doesn't use, but the children who are being radiographed, they are covered by this. This is the TLD badge with which you can monitor the amount of radiation you are exposed to. Protection for the patient. First of all, the requirement for radio, uh, you know, the need to take a radiograph should be determined. When do you take a radiograph? If your clinical diagnosis will change or the treatment methodology will change after taking a radiograph. Okay? This is the same rule which you apply instead of taking a conventional IOPA and you refer a CBCT. You need to know the importance and whether it's going to help you in further diagnosis and the treatment of the patient has changed. So selection of the image receptor, that is the type of film you use, fast films or slow films, film screens, intensifying screens, whether you want to use digital radiography or conventional radiography, focus for distance, collimation of the beam, filtration of the beam. Now, the KVP of the machine which you are using, you know there are some very, very cheap machines available in the market. Another KVP and MA which is there is less. Now, these machines will not give you a good radiograph, a good diagnostic value. They are cheaper, but the diagnostic value is less and they will last long, uh, for a lesser time also. So you need to know which machine to buy and the KVP and MA is one of the uh, one of the criteria for selection. Use of open-ended cylinders, use of film holding devices, use of timers. Previously, we used to get conventional timers, screen control timers, and the timing for exposure was in minutes. Now we have 0 0.5 seconds. So okay, those are the electronic timers. Positioning of indicating devices, use of protective barriers, use of a proper technique, processing of the image should be proper in interpretation. Taking a radiograph is not enough. If the technique that you use is not proper, you will not get a good image. If you don't process it properly, you will not get a good image. And after doing all this, if you don't know the interpretation and you are not able to interpret properly, the entire exercise is wasted. Now, protection from radiation, protection from the environment, so uh, basically what we do is there are certain uh, quality assurance tests which need to be carried out the, and you have to make sure that the primary beam should always be directed towards the patient and the, air, and the area to be radiographed. The patient should be positioned so the X-ray beam is aimed at the wall of a room and not to a door so that the radiation does go to the next room. There are certain criteria given by AERP of the thickness of the wall, whether it should be lead line and the thickness of the bricks which have to be used, which you need to look up before you start your clinic. Okay, so these are very important. Continuing dental education for the operator, for the patient, radiation monitoring devices and like your TLD badge and also the environment where the regular quality control checks are done by AERP and Dentec. To, the, to find out whether there is any stray or leakage radiation happening from your machines.